In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. So nice to see a big crowd here today. I want to begin by sharing an ancient Chinese proverb that I shared at Dog Church a couple of weeks ago. Uh, For those who might have been there, I apologize, but uh, uh, it fits. Uh, So there's a young farmer, and he uh, he has a small farm, and he owns one horse, and the horse is in uh, the corral, and one day somehow the horse escapes, and the, uh, the neighbor comes over and said, I heard about your horse, what bad luck? And the farmer said, maybe so, maybe not. And uh, a few days later, the horse comes back and he's got three other horses with him. And he puts them in the corral and the neighbor comes over and says, I heard about the horse and it brought three new horses with you. What good fortune you have. And he said, maybe so, maybe not. And uh, one of the horses is particularly rambunctious and uh, his son decides he's going to try to break that horse. And he climbs up on the horse and the horse throws him off and he breaks his leg. And the neighbor comes back over and says, my goodness, I heard about your son's leg. What bad luck. He said, maybe so, maybe not. And uh, the next day, the king's army comes through. Uh, on the way to a battle and they're conscripting every boy uh, of fighting age and his son doesn't have to go because he's got a broken leg. It goes on and on and on. We really don't know, do we, whether something's good luck or bad luck. Isn't it amazing how we as human beings waste so much time and energy regretting things that have already happened, wishing we could somehow change something about the past or clinging to the past hurt, slights, and disappointments? Perhaps worse is the energy we expend worrying about our future. Will I run out of money in retirement? Uh, Will my child get hurt if I allow her to go out with friends overnight? Or how we decide sometimes there's only one career path that will be satisfying for us and then spend years positioning ourselves for that one ideal job somewhere out there in the future, only to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. Or perhaps when it does. (laughs) Uh, The truth is that the past, no matter how wonderful or terrible, is gone. It doesn't exist except to the degree that we continue to resurrect it in our own minds. And the future hasn't even happened, yet our incessant focus on what could happen or what we want to happen takes up an enormous amount of space in our brains. And the truly sad thing is that the main casualty of this imprisonment to our past or futures is the gift of the present. And it is in the present that we encounter the blessing of Jesus. Today's gospel is the fourth reading in five Sunday series on Jesus as the bread of life. And for many of us, it is a difficult, disturbing, and even a grotesque reading. I mean, eating flesh and drinking blood is the kind of, it's the stuff of zombie movies. We want to cover our children's ears to keep them from having bad, bad dreams. But such ideas and the ideas behind those words would not have been disturbing to Jesus' audience. In fact, such images would have been normal and commonplace to anyone brought brought up in a world uh, where animal sacrifice was commonplace. Professor William Barclay, in his excellent commentary on this passage, reminds us that when animals were sacrificed, the whole animal was rarely burned. Rather, only a token portion was offered to the god or gods. Then a portion was set aside for the priests, and then the rest was given to the worshipers so that they might make a feast for themselves and their friends in the temple precincts. The belief was that when an animal was offered to God, that God entered into it. So when people consumed it, they were literally eating their God, becoming God-filled. But Jesus took it a step further. In Jewish thought, the blood of an animal or human stood for its life. We can see where that that could be. Uh, If you have a wound and you lose too much blood, you die. To Jews, blood and the life that it carried was not their own. It belonged to God. So Jesus' admonition to drink his blood would have been scandalous to the Jewish ear. Not because it was grotesque, but because life belongs to God. Was he really suggesting they steal from God? 
how blasphemous. But while it may have been difficult, perhaps impossible for them to understand, Jesus was inviting them to take him in all of his humanity, in all of his divinity, into the deepest recesses of their hearts to become one with them, to have their lives animated by his. The language used in John's gospel today can't help but elicit images of Holy Communion and the mystical presence of Christ that Chris spoke so beautifully of last week. But I think it's important to note that the writer of John's gospel does not place uh, the words of Jesus in the context of the Last Supper. In fact, the Last Supper isn't mentioned in, in John's gospel. Rather, his teaching is situated in the context of Jesus is just having miraculously fed 5,000 people. In John's gospel, Jesus does not say, do this in remembrance of me. Rather, he's saying, I believe, simply, I am enough. Remember when you were hungry, I fed you. I started with five loaves and two fishes, and when it was all said and done, we had 12 baskets filled with fish and bread. Please, just trust me. I am enough. By placing the story in the context of this miracle, John is communicating a sense of abundance, even extravagance. Now, mind you, this is no proto-prosperity gospel falsely proclaimed by those who insist that declaring faith in Christ uh, exempts one from life's difficulties. That is not true. Rather, Jesus is saying, if you trust me, with all your heart. As you go through life, you will never be alone, for I will abide in you and you in me. You will never hunger or thirst for my Father's love. No matter what life throws at you, I am with you. We are one. We will travel your journey together, and I promise I will be enough. I know there's a, a bunch of Baptists in here, and you're going you're gonna to know what I'm talking about next. When I was a boy, my favorite vacation Bible school song was, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Well, my favorite verse of that was the third verse. And that, it, you remember, I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. I just love that as hard as it was to say. <laughs> I think that Jesus is really promising, what Jesus is really promising is the peace that passes all understanding. The blessed assurance that even when things are at their darkest, as the mystic Julian of Norwich promised, all will be well. All manner of things will be well. It seems to me that the farmer in the proverb I opened with modeled that kind of peace. He was unconcerned about things that had already happened or that might happen in the future. He simply lived in peace, in the present, fully embracing whatever life might bring him. Jesus promises us that that peace is available to us too. The Nobel laureate Hermann Hesse is known primarily for his novels. You remember some of them, Siddhartha, Steppenwolf, The Glass Bead Game. But he was also a poet, and I just uh, came across a book of uh, poems that have just recently been translated into English, never having been done so before. And I opened the book as I was preparing the sermon, and just by pure coincidence, maybe, uh, I opened uh, this to a poem called Happiness. As long as you chase happiness, you are not ready to be happy even if you owned everything. As long as you lament loss, run after prizes in restless races, you have not yet known peace. But when you have moved beyond desire, become a stranger to your goals and longings and call no longer on happiness by name, then your heart rises calmly above the ebb and flow of action and peace has reached your soul. Jesus invites us into that peace that comes from knowing that he abides in us and us in him. And he promises that he is enough. Amen.